Good morning. morning. Hallelujah. Jesus has risen from the grave. What great news. Because of his resurrection, we have an ultimate hope. We have a hope that's better than this world, that's better than your gifts, that's better than your faults, your failures, or your successes. Jesus, our Lord, demonstrated his life, his life of perfection, and then he died the death that you deserve, and then he was risen from the grave, proving that he was victorious over sin, over shame, and over death, and in Christ we have eternal life. That song will preach itself. My name is Pastor Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Convergence. Uh, if you're a visitor, we're glad you're here with us. Uh, this is the time of the service. We've come to hear the Word of God, but I want to start by uh, giving you guys a little history lesson. I was born in 1978, and uh, in the 80s, they had these things called Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, we didn't have Netflix. We didn't have uh, YouTube. We didn't have any of that stuff, so we'd wake up early on Saturday morning and watch cartoons. Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Uh, cartoons. Some of these cartoons I actually aired after school as well, but some of my favorites were uh, G.I. Joe, uh, the Jetsons, uh, the Flintstones. And one thing that I want to put before us today is that uh, the cartoon, The Jetsons, which was actually uh, created in the 1960s, it, it talked about a future, a future where there would be uh, artificial intelligence, which would uh, speak to us. An artificial intelligence would, would help clean the house. There was a robotic maid, uh, cars that would drive themselves. And here we are some 60 years later with that technology in place. Now, some people would call this predictive programming, meaning that we're going we're gonna to tell you what the future is so when it comes, uh, you won't be alarmed by it or even that you will be conditioned to help uh, fabricate and move towards that goal. And I think that's what's happened when we look at the Jetsons. Now we see... Uh, there was a, a, a maid named Rosie, and now we have a robotic vacuum called Roby. Any of y'all have that? Uh, I learned the other day that there's a, there's a robotic um, lawn mowing machine mechanism. I don't know if any of you guys have that. Maybe the, the Conleys could use that. It might not ever stop. And then also now we have this, this thing called Siri and Alexa where we, we speak and we ask a question, and they tell us the answer. So in some ways, we've seen a prophetic fulfillment of what went on in Jetsons, amen? And so I believe that as we look at this funny story of the Jetsons, it highlights for us that whatever our future reality is becomes our present reality. So whatever we believe about our future will help inform the way that we live now. And so I believe that's one of the primary reasons that the Holy Spirit gave us the book of Revelation, Regardless of your end times view, all Christians would agree that Jesus wins in the end. That sin will be eradicated, that Satan and his fallen angels will fall into the pit of despair, and Jesus and his bride will be lifted up for all eternity, praising the King of kings, the Lord of lords, for all eternity. This is where our hope is, right? As we look around our culture, as we look around our society, we look around our homes, we look in the mirror, we see brokenness, we see failures, we see faults. And so in today's passage, Paul's going to remind us that we have a great prize. We have a great hope. We have a great call. And this great prize, this great hope, this great call gives us hope for how we live now. Paul's going to argue and show us that our natural tendency will be, allowed, will be for our past to allow to disrail our present and then disrupt our future. So I think Paul's arguing here, and I hope that the Spirit of God would use me to show you that in order for us to have a healthy balance as Christians, we must have our eyes fixed on the right goal. And the goal that Paul is laying out here in today's scripture, he calls it the upward call of God. The upward call of God. So if you guys would stand, we're going to read together from Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 through 16, and we're going to explore what this upward call of God looks like. This upward call of God. Starting off in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's pray. God, thank you for the upward call of, of you in Christ. I pray that your people who have been called according to your purposes in this room would reorient and fix their eyes back on you, Lord, today. That we would repent of any distractions, any flaring up in our own flesh, in our own life, which would prohibit us from living out this upward call. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work in the hearts of those who have yet to receive the upward call today. That you would bring them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That you would bring them closer to the cross of Christ. That they would get to experience the forgiveness of sins and be a part of the family of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. So the first point, which might be the most important point of all, is that the upward call of God is rooted in Christ. We're going to tackle all these verses, and I'm going to break them down for you, but I want you first to look at the last part of verse 12. Paul says here, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I want to go back to give you some context from verses 8 through 11 here. He says this, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, become like him in death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The upward call of God is rooted in Christ. So what's the opposite of up? Down. The upward call on mankind, as, as it were, was for, to be redeemed back to the Father so that we might experience God's fullness as it was intended in the garden before sin ever came. And so we see here in Paul's letter that, that he's saying, listen, in order for him to obtain this upward call, it must be in and through Christ, through Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection. that he's known by Christ, that he knows Christ. The upward call is rooted in Christ. John 10, 14, 15 says this, Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. If you are a Christian in here today, know that your upward call is not rooted in anything else but Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Do you know that as Jesus was walking the earth and he died for you, he knew he would die for you? He says here in, in, in John 10 that he knows his sheep, and in turn his sheep know him. It's rooted in Christ. There's a lot of things that distract us from Christ. There's a lot of things that distract us from our call, but we must understand that if we are going to be called by God in Christ, that our lives must be in Christ. It sounds elementary, it sounds plain, but it needs to be said that if you're here today and you're not in Christ, you do not have the upward call on your life. You will not experience the new heaven, the new earth. You will not experience the full glory of God. You will not experience God's full love on display. If you're here today and you haven't trusted in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, then the upward call is not on your life. So my question for everyone here, whether you've attended church your whole life or not, is do you have the upward call in your life? Do you have Christ in your heart? 
Have you bowed your knee? Have you surrendered your life? Is Jesus living in you and through you? This is a serious call. Because the opposite of the upward call of Christ is hell. The place where every sinner deserves to go, including you and me. But some 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to live the life that you could not live and die the death that you deserved. The cross that we spoke about, the resurrection that we spoke about. He did that for you. Ultimately bring glory to the Father, but he did it for you to redeem you back to God himself. Your sin has earned you a downward call. Your sin has earned you a penalty. And the only just payment is wrath, torment. It's not fun to talk about, but Jesus did. So we need to talk about it, right? Because the upward call is in Christ. The opposite is that we deserve hell. And so if you're in here today and, you, and, and you're not yet a follower of Christ, I want to implore you, if I could lay my life down and weep for you, I would. It's no coincidence that you're here. It's no, it's no happenstance. You didn't just stumble in here. God ordained you to be here today to call you to this upward call to follow Jesus. It's not too late. Today could be your day of destiny being changed, reoriented, as it were. Your heart of stone could become heart of flesh. Call on Jesus and receive the upward call. We would be happy, any one of us, to talk with you about that. Don't leave here today without challenging yourself in this upward call. And so for those of us who are in Christ, who have this upward call on our life, why do we become so distracted? Why do we become so apathetic and lazy towards the upward call? And so this, this scripture here, Paul is not just giving a, 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 just a feel-good message about the upward call, but he's calling Christians to be motivated to continue to pursue this upward call. We see here in verses 12, 13, and 14. Verse 12a, he says, Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. Verse 13a. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. Verse 14, he says, press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Two major things I want you to see here about this continual pursuit is, one, we have not arrived. Let's, let's say that collectively. We have not arrived. We have not arrived. This is not our final destination, church. Paul, who had all reason to boast, probably one of the greatest heroes of the faith, major contributor to the Bible, wrote most of the New Testament. He's done a lot more than we have, both before Christ and after. And he's saying here, he has not yet arrived. Paul is not yet perfect. And neither are we. So the two major things, we have not yet arrived. And the second is that we need to strain for what lies ahead. Verse 14, he says, he presses on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He is motivated to keep pressing on because he has not yet arrived. So my question for you is, are you resting in the fact that you're saved? Does your salvation then become like a couch that you sit on and an ottoman for you to prop your feet on? and a TV set for you to watch? Or are you continuing to press on to know God and to make him known? Why do we struggle to press on? I think Paul lays it out here for us in his third point. And he calls us and he says, the upward call of God must not be hindered by our past. Everybody in here has a past. Verse 13b says, One thing I do is forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I love how Paul says here, there's one thing I do, and then he tells you two things he's doing, right? And the reason I think that is because this one thing is it requires two things. If I'm moving this way, I'm 
by nature, I'm moving away from this. Amen. And so as Paul's moving forward to what lies ahead, he's leaving behind the things that don't matter. As he's pressing on to the prize of the upward call, he is counting everything else as rubbish. Now, there's tons of scripture that call us to remember the past, right? So we don't forget everything about the past. So what should we remember? Well, I think we remember the good details of our past that bring God glory. It's good for us to remember that we were sinners who were lost, desperate, and without hope, and that God came to redeem us. We should remember that. We should remember the times of God's faithfulness to us. Amen, church? These will help us move forward to the upward call. There's some things that are worth remembering. It's good to remember Scripture. It's good to remember how the Holy Spirit has worked in and through your life. So what do we forget? Anything that does not bring the Lord glory. Simply put. Paul lays out a list that Brother Jacob did a great job of last week. There are all the religious things that Paul did and all the irreligious things that Paul did. Those things, the things that Paul was counting as working towards or attaining some form of salvation, he laid those things aside. The word scubulon is, is excrement, right? What do we do with our excrement? You flush it. You throw yours away. I flush mine down the toilet. Nobody keeps that. No one, no one holds on to these things and says, I'm going to put this stuff in the pantry. I'm going to box it up in a nice, neat place. Let's put it in a Ziploc bag and let's freeze it and pull it out a year from now. No one would do that. And Paul, who was the chief of Pharisees, the chief Jew who studied, knew more scripture than all of us in this room combined, he said all that stuff is rubbish at the surpassing worth of knowing God. And some of us here, we've hold on to, to things in our past. Maybe good things you've done for the Lord. Look at what I did three years ago. Six months ago, I was, I was leading the GCG. We did these things. If anyone, Paul could talk, he could boast in all the churches he planted, all the missionaries he'd sent out. And he's saying, listen, I am striving for what lies ahead. Forgetting the past and striving for what lies ahead. Because the reality, church, none of us are defined by what we do here. We are defined by who we are in the new heaven, new earth. And so just to be clear, that doesn't give you an excuse to do nothing. If you're hearing me say that, then you've you're missing the point. We are defined and we have a right standing with God. We are seen as completely forgiven. Sinful men and women taken from excrement and made new, made righteous. And that's what motivates our life now. Our future glory. So the question is, do you have your past in proper perspective? Or does your past get in the way of running the race that the Lord has called you to do? Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, makes a distinction that this is not easy work. It's not easy to focus on the upward. We all struggle with that. Amen? At times we struggle to keep our eyes focused and, and, and leaving this excrement behind. And Paul says here in verse 15, Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So the fourth point is the upward call of God is a maturation process. It's a sign of maturity to live out this call. So this should encourage a lot of us in the room who struggle to live up the upward call. We realize our future goal, and that is what informs the way that we live. Paul says, those who don't see this way are actually immature and need God to reveal it to them today, or reveal it to them then. So, so I think that God wants to reveal that to us through the scripture. 
I hear a lot of times that what makes someone a spiritually mature Christian. Oh, he reads his Bible and he prays daily. Those are great things. But Paul's saying a sign of spiritual maturity is someone who lives out this call on their life. And we know the ongoing repentance in our life is part of the sanctification process. Just like Paul says he's not fully perfect. We will never fully mature in this process until we receive the glory of God in his presence. But we strive towards it. So remember that this whole, this whole book, the whole book of Philippians, I know it may seem there's been a lot of hard messages uh, through Philippians. I don't know if maybe we're the Spirit of God just doing something here particularly, but the main point of, of Paul writing this book is to help deliver joy to them. And the way he says that this joy will be accomplished is through their humiliation or their process of humbling themselves. Amen. So if you're feeling humble today, your toes are a little stepped on, maybe, maybe mine as well. Remember, God's humbling us for a purpose. He wants to bring us joy. So if a sign of a mature, mature Christian is, is someone who's known for being humble, the opposite of humility is pride. Here's some ways that pride creeps up in the church. The pride of knowledge. Theological knowledge, life experience knowledge, missional knowledge, whatever it is. And the way that we see this manifest is people who don't listen to others. People who are unwilling to listen in a conversation to other people. My wife hates when I do that. I've got some allergies, so I apologize. I'm listening to her. She said, don't do that. But a sign of pride is someone who doesn't listen to others. And so I won't go in great in-depth on this, but I'm convinced that probably the majority, overwhelming majority of us, don't listen to others well. And so just a, a little tool I'll give you that's been beneficial for me lately is when someone tells you something or texts you something, repeat back to them what you thought you heard them say. It's called reflective listening. So is this what you said? This is what I'm hearing you say. And they'll say, no, that's not what I said. This is what I said. Oh, and then repeat it back. Make sure that you're actually communicating. And then instead of, instead of them saying, hey, I don't like when you do this. And the first thing is, I want to tell you all the things why I'm right. Just say, hey, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you right. You don't like that I did this. And then say, hey, will you, can you listen to me for a second? And then you tell them what you're thinking. And then ask them, hey, what did you hear me say? This simple tool can save your marriage. It can save division in the church. So just practice that. A sign of a mature Christian is someone who listens to others. What about the pride of power? How do we see this manifest? Those who seek to control the pride of appearance. We all want to look good. Maybe we're people pleasers. The pride of spirituality. This is a sneaky one. Because we want to fan the flames of those who are doing the work. And sometimes what we're doing is we're whitewashing the outside. Keep going, but the inside is, is decaying. Sometimes our spirituality can, can rear its ugly head and become the thing that causes us pride. But God has not called us to pride. Instead, he's called us to humble ourselves as he has called us to his kingdom. And that is what's worth holding on to, which is my fifth point. The upward call of God is worth holding on to. Verse 16, Paul says, Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. As I was studying for this passage, I heard another pastor say that his friend was at the beach. There a couple of families at the beach, and they were all having fun. And this guy's like 10-year-old daughter was swimming, and she got, uh, she got swept ashore, or she got swept away by the current. And they're all playing, and next thing you know, she's like 50 yards away or whatever. And the mom just went running through the water, and she grabbed her, and she held her. As her daughter was drowning, she brought her back to shore, and she held her. I think this is a good picture for us. Is we need to be running towards the call of God in the same way. 
And when we get it, we don't want to let it go. And the relationship of mother and daughter pales in comparison to the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. Amen? Paul calls it a prize in verse 14. This prize, this, this eternal truth, this immeasurable worth. So what is it, Brian? What is the calling? Hebrews 3.1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. The writer of Hebrews says it's a heavenly calling. 1 Thessalonians 2.12. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We're called into a kingdom of glory. 2 Thessalonians 2.14. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been called through the gospel that you may obtain the glory of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Peter 5.10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. This confirms what Paul said earlier in verses 8 through 10. That he may know him in the power of his resurrection. He may share in his sufferings becoming like him in death, that by any means possible, he may obtain the resurrection from the dead. This is the beautiful part, Romans 8.30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Romans 11.29 says, For the gifts... And the calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. This calling on your life is irrevocable. What does irrevocable mean? Not able to be changed, reversed, or recovered. It's final. It's a sure thing. This heavenly calling that we've been given, church, this upward call of God is a sure thing. It's worth running towards. So my question is, what are you putting before you? What are you beholding? Like the Jetsons conditioned so many kids to be future inventors, engineers, and visionaries, will you allow the glory of Christ and his majesty, his never-ending kingdom, his enduring love, will you allow this to motivate you to the way that you live today, to bear fruit that is keeping in repentance of your old life and moving towards your future? It's easier said than done, right? It's easier said than done. I want to help you understand why we get so distracted from our upward call. Who or what is the biggest hindrance to your upward call? Anyone? Ourselves. It's not the secular government issuing rules against you. It's not the wicked entertainment industry who is parading evil across all spectrums. It's not the people in your life who are speaking ill against you in the gospel. Yes, these hindrances are legitimate, but the biggest enemy is you, the enemy within. You are the biggest hindrance to the gospel and the upward call in your life. I'm going to list for you guys 10 enemies, and I want you to pay attention as I'm reading them. These 10 enemies are robbers of us living out the upward call. In our time of reflection, we're going to see which one relates most to you, and I want you to confess that because I want us as a church to be the people of God who are maturing, as Paul says, to this upward call. The first is the judge. The judge is the master thief, the one who everyone suffers from. It compels you to constantly find faults with yourself, others, and your conditions and circumstances. It generates much of your anxiety, stress, anger, disappointment, shame, and guilt. Its self-justifying lie is that without it, you or others would turn into lazy and um, unambitious beings who would not achieve much. Its voice is therefore often mistaken as tough love, voice of reason, rather than the destructive thief it actually is. The second is the avoider. The avoider focuses on the positive and the pleasant in an extreme way. It avoids difficult and unpleasant tasks and conflicts. It leads you to the habits of procrastination and conflict avoidance. Its results in damaging 
eruptions and festering conflicts that have been sidestepped and caused delays in getting things done. Its lie is that you are being positive, not avoiding your problems. The third is the controller. The controller runs on an anxiety-based need to take charge, control situation, and bends people's action to one, one's own will. It generates high anxiety and impatience when that is not possible. In the controller's worldview, you are either in control or out of control. While the controller allows you to get short-term results, in the long term, it generates resentment in others and prevents them from exercising and developing their own fullest capacities. It's lies that you need the controller to generate the best results from the people around you. Hyperachiever. The hyperachiever makes you dependent on constant performance and achievement for self-respect and self-validation. It keeps you focused mainly on external success rather than an internal criteria for happiness. It often leads to unsustainable workaholic tendencies and causes you to fall out of touch with deeper emotional and relational needs. Its lie is that your self-acceptance should be conditional on performance and external validation. Hyperrational. The hyperrational involves an intense and exclusive focus on the rational process of everything, including relationships. It causes you to be impatient with people's emotions and regard emotions as unworthy of much time or consideration. When under the influence of the hyperrational, you can be perceived as cold, distant, or intellectually arrogant. It limits your depth and flexibility in relationships at work or in your personal life and intimidates less analytically minded people. Its lie is that the, national, the rational mind is the most important and helpful form of intelligence that you process. Totally dismisses emotion. Hypervigilant. Hypervigilant makes you feel intense and continuously anxious about all the dangers surrounding you and everything that could go wrong. It is constantly vigilant and can never offer rest. Its result is a great deal of ongoing stress that wears you and others down. Its lie is that the dangers around are bigger than they actually are and the nonstop vigilance is the best way to tackle them. The pleaser. The pleaser compels you to try to gain acceptance and affection by helping, pleasing, rescuing, or flattering others constantly. It causes you to lose sight of your own needs and become resentful of others as a result. It also encourages others to become overly dependent on you. Its lie is that you are pleasing others because it's a good thing to do, denying that you are really trying to win affection and acceptance indirectly. Restless. The restless is constantly in search of greater excitement. The next activity. It doesn't allow you to feel much peace or contentment with your current activity. It gives you a never-ending stream of distractions that make you lose your focus on the things and relationships that truly matter. Other people have a difficult time keeping up with the person ruled by the restless and often feel dis distance from him or her. Its lie is that by being so busy, you are living life fully, but ignores the fact in pursuit, but ignores the fact that in pursuit of a full life, you miss out on your life as it's actually happening. The stickler. The stickler is the need for perfection, order, and organization taken too far. It makes you and others around you anxious and uptight. It saps your own or others' energy on extra measures of perfection that are not necessary. It also causes you to live in constant frustration with yourself and others over things not being done perfect enough. Its lie is that perfectionism is always good and that you will not have to pay a huge price to achieve it. Last is the victim. The victim wants you to feel emotional and temperamental as a way of gaining affection and attention. It results in an extreme focus on internal feelings, particularly painful ones, and can often result in a martyr streak. The consequences are that you waste your mental and emotional energy and others feel frustrated, helpless, or guilty that they can never make you happy for very long. The victim's lie is that assuming the victim or martyr persona is the best way to attract caring and attention for yourself. Church, we need to repent of this stuff. The reality is that each one of us has a few of these. I'm reading them like, yeah, that's, that's me, that's me, that's me. But we need to learn to identify these things and call them what they are and leave them behind and strive to our upwards call. These are the things that distract us from living out our kingdom mindset, our kingdom call. Luke 962, 962. Jesus said, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. 
And so some of, these, some of you guys are going to want to justify why you are this way. And Jesus is saying, I need you to move forward. I need you to let these things die off. These things don't glorify me. These things are more about you than me. And those things need to be like excrement and flushed away. And they need to become part of your past and something you never think about again and move towards me. Just a reminder what the church is, the definition of church, the ecclesia is the called out ones in scripture. We are a called out people, but we are called to something. And so my question for you is, as you hear this message, as you ponder this, these these attributes that are negative, what is God calling you to? Are you pressing towards your goals or God's goals? Are you pressing towards your kingdom or the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God in your life costs Jesus everything. So if you're pressing into the kingdom, it's going to cost you something. But I want to close with the scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And so, church, as we work towards our upward call of God in Christ, this great treasure that we have in the gospel, the sure thing that we have in our Lord, let us work for him and know that as we're working for him, he is with us. And he will bear fruit in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. God, we have a lot of things to repent of. And um, we, we really just scratching the surface of um, the thieves of joy, the thieves of the upward call. And so, Lord, I pray that today that each person would just, in some way, shape, or form, just, just think through these ten thieves. And, Lord, that they would, um, Lord, just repent. Lord, you said you came that we would have life and have it abundant. And um, Lord, we're not in, we don't sin because of you, we sin because of us. And so I pray you'd make us holier and you'd help us to, to be called out ones who are living a life straining towards the upward call. Just like our brother, the Apostle Paul. Spirit, we need your help. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to spend about five minutes. I want you guys to, um, if you want, I can send that list out on Group Me. Yeah, because there's a lot there. Um, and this, again, I say this all the time. If, if preaching ever makes you feel condemned, then, then, then first off, that's not of God, and that's not my intention. But I am calling us to be courageous. I'm calling you to evaluate yourself and say, man, you know what, Pastor Brian, yeah, I'm like three of those things all the time, and it's really, it's really prohibited me from having joy in my life. And if, and if you're honest, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of each of them in your life. But I'd like for you guys to, to break up in groups, uh, three to five people, as you feel comfortable, and just confess one. Like, man, here's my tendency. I, I, I'm, I'm drawn towards this way. And confess it. Take a moment to confess this enemy in your life. And we'll come back together corporately and we'll pray for each other. But the goal is become more like Jesus, right? Jesus, the high priest, who was none of these things. He was the opposite. So let's take about five to seven minutes, break up and spend some time in confession. <laughs>